So today, uh, we're going to continue, uh, and now we're going to start getting closer to applying uh, the vibration analysis or the frequency response analysis to piezoelectric materials. And before uh, what we're actually we're, we're going to cover first uh, in this uh, lecture is mechanical response. And mechanical response, uh, it goes under two categories as a little bit of a repeat, but it, we have displacement and we also have velocity. So we're going to be solving for these two ca uh, categories with regards to piezoelectric materials now. And uh, last time, what we focused our discussion on was single degree of freedom. It's called one degree of freedom systems, and that's either you know an LCR circuit or uh, it is a mass spring damper. So we have our mass, we have our spring, we have our damper. And this is a one degree of freedom. The reason is there's only one type of displacement happening here. But however, we can also make more complicated systems by connecting mass spring damper systems together. And the way we do this is we have uh, we have a spring, just like we did before, but we have multiple masses. So you can imagine the displacement of x1, let's call this mass 1, is not necessarily the same as the displacement of x2, although they're related by the spring in the middle, uh, the displacement of each of these masses are not necessarily the same. And the, you can kind of imagine this one's coming down sometime, maybe this one's coming up, and they're kind of like bobbling back and forth. And their displacement is obviously not uh, together, but they do influence each other. However, when we talk about uh, piezoelectric materials, uh, initially we need to consider what we call an infinite degree of freedom system. So what do I mean by infinite degree of freedom? So let's say we had these masses. I'm just going to draw them sideways to give an example. But instead of like how many, so we have 1x1, and now we have x2, and we have x3. We have all these different, but let's say this keeps going and going and going and going to infinity. And also we have it going this way. And this is basically, this kind of representation is basically what we're talking about when we have a real material. A real material is not a discrete mass, and it's not a discrete spring. Although we were treating it like that earlier because we could in DC analysis. What if we have a very low electric field or a very low uh, frequency, or, or the frequency is at, this is zero, basically. DC. In that case, we could treat it like you know this kind of system where we had the mass and we had a spring. You know, we we calculate the equivalent mass, the volume times the density, and the equivalent spring constant. And we went over all of that when we were talking about the uh, piezoelectric coupling coefficient. But in this case, what we can kind of talk about is like a little sliver, and you know this reminds you of what integration. So there's like a dx here. So for example, if you want to find the uh, mass of a, of a this dx, so d how much is dm? How much is it, uh, the, uh, the mass? Because let's say we're, we're, it's vibrating this way back and forth. So we can simplify the problem. Uh, it's only vibrating in, let's call this the uh, x direction or the one direction, the x one direction. So it's only vibrating in, in, in this way. So let's just say this. What's the mass? What's the we can we can kind of make this problem then a then a one D problem. It's one D meaning there's only one dimension of motion, but there are many possibilities for motion happening. So this is like a little mass, and it's connected to the next part, which is this part, uh, by a spring, and then but it has another mass, and the dm is equal to uh, dx times the perimeter which gives the volume, which is this is the volume, that's dv, and times the density. 
So you can see in this way, uh, you, you can kind of see how we go from these parameters. And there's an also another uh, way to do find how do you find the equivalent spring constant. We can also find this out using differential analysis and kind of analyzing. And this is going to be obviously related with 1 over the uh, elastic compliance. And we're using the PS electric term. So this is going to be related to the elastic compliance, the uh, uh, differential spring constant. So what actually we end up getting, uh, you know, by kind of using this analysis and solving, we can come up with a differential equation describing uh, the motion. So the differential equation, it comes in this form. And we can, you can find further analysis and a deeper discussion of how you derive these equations uh, in a vibrations textbook. Uh, that would be handy just to know how to do it once, but usually when we're solving these, we kind of start from this equation. Or I'm just going to call this, I'm not going to delineate what this S is, I'll just write S. This is like a general system right now. So basically, how you, what you do with this problem, you apply boundary conditions. You apply the boundary conditions, and by doing this, you can solve for the equation, and uh, it'll give you the solution. So what is actually the solution in this case? I mentioned that we had, uh, you know, this 3D material, which we can kind of represent as a 1D representation. So let me just draw a little box here. We'll assume that the zero point is there. And we'll just give a random x value. We'll just call this x1. This is, a, this is just the position. So this is x. That's positive. Let's say this is x1. And at x1, we have u x1 t and it'll become clear what u is. u is actually the displacement. So let's say we applied an electric field plus minus. We applied an electric field and then what happens? The material it expands. So we'll just draw a little slightly bigger material. And this x1, uh, let's just draw this dot which, which represent x1 and originally. It moves here. So basically this distance is u x1 per time because we're we're gonna we're gonna use the time varying electric field so there's gonna be a displacement in time so this is the new x1 and this is basically displacement referenced to the initial point the displacement referenced to the initial point is x1 thereby uh, we can kind of understand uh, now we're going we're going to look at so what is an off resonance uh, what is the displacement? So this is what I said. This is this u parameter is the displacement. So let's discuss the off resonance displacement. Kind of what we were doing initially. So basically, we have uniform strain, or we have a constant displacement. So let's just draw a line. So let's say this is displacement u, and this is t. Or sorry, this is x. So as we are moving along, we have more and more displacement because, uh, you know, when this this point right here, it moves over, it also pushes the next one over, and then also the next one also the next point also gets pushed over. So if you look at if you look here and we keep uh, drawing these, when this sliver over here moves left, it will automatically push the next one physically left, and that one will also expand. So they're kind of they're kind of integrate with each other to find to do the final displacement. They kind of push each other along. So this is uniform strain, I mean uniform displacement, and it's also uh, the strain. It's also uniform. It's also uniform, but when the strain is uniform, we draw it as a straight line. So either we could have a straight line positive. Or we can have a straight line negative, and this 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 negative. If this is the uh, an electric field applied on the other side, we would have a negative electric field or positive displacement. So this is strain. I'm gonna write this as a curly x, uh, and this is again this regular x, which is just, just the position. Uh, see, because we had this equation earlier, right? We had uh, 
the strain equals d times e. But once you have the strain, how do you find the displacement u? And remember, when we normally calculate the displacement u, we calculate it with regards to the edge. So basically u, and if we call this point 0 and this point L, uh, meaning the length, uh, then we say what's the displacement at UL? We're not saying it's time varying right now. Let's just say we're just the old case where we had the DC field. Uh, this then equals uh, X times L, which is just delta L, which is actually U. So this is the case. So we can, if you plug in here, DE, you'll have to actually have the, uh, the case for uh, this displacement. And then, like, look, it, it, since the, the strain is uniform, uh, the displacement is also uniform. So using a straight line curve, uh, you can kind of calculate uh, the strain. So how do you do that? I said that U is right X. And U has to be on a domain from 0 to L. Okay, zero to L. We're assume, we'll assume that we're, we're measuring respective of the zero point. We can also measure respective of this point. If we if we measure respective of the zero point, we'll basically have this kind of displacement. This is the regular x. But if we measure respective of the zero point in the middle, then we'll have this type of a displacement. So this would be L. And uh, if you measure respect to the middle we'll have L in a different spot. We'll have L here, L over 2. Because it just matters what you're talking about uh, with regards to displacement. So we'll basically have this uh, U equals X, the strain, L as the maximum strain. But how do you find that that's what's in the middle? UX It's nothing other than the maximum strain, uh, which is strain times L, and that's the then this is the slope. This is uh this in this direction. This is going to be well. This is L over two, but if we're doing this way, we we have L, and this displacement is strain times L. So basically, the displacement is going to be. is going to be the slope which is a rise over run so the rise is u over l and the run is l uh, so but actually we know that u is xl over l so x this is the actual slope x times uh, basically the strain times x equals u x uh, and this is a curly x which is represents strain so obviously, and this is only valid on the on the domain L to zero. At zero, at the zero point, you'll say there is no strain, but at the other side, you'll say there. I mean, there is no displacement because that's where you're assuming zero. But if you wanted to do uh, in the other case where you had the strain sent the strain, and you want to reference everything from the middle of the previous logic material, and then say it expands, you know, outward, both sides expand. Uh, if you want to you want to have that type of analysis, uh, then you would simply just modify zero L. So you're not from zero to L, but you're gonna have from negative one half L to L. So you'd basically do this strain, which is it's the same slope, right? The same slope here and the same slope here because the slope actually is the strain, as I as I think I mentioned earlier. Uh, when you're me when you're measuring the strain, uh, if you take the first derivative with respect to the displacement, with uh, respect to the the, the uh, dimension, which is the distance position, you get strain, which is this curly x. So this is actually the definition of strain, uh, which is why you can see uh, when this is oh, when the derivative of this slope is this. And this is a very important point to uh, remember that the derivative of the position, or the derivative of the displacement, is the strain. So we see at the point where there is the, uh, because this all of this starts integrating, 
As you keep full going further, we start integrating the strain to get the displacement. We'll continue in the next video.